Army Rangers. Army Special Forces. Two of the United States Army's most highly trained and lethal warriors. What sets them apart? What do they have in common? What can they do? Let's take a dive into what you need to know about Rangers and Special Forces. We'll start off the video with a brief introduction on both of these units. First up is the Army Rangers. The Army Rangers are a lethal, agile, flexible force, and are the Army's premier direct action raid force, who are capable of conducting many complex, joint special operations missions. They are an elite, light infantry unit. Next is the Army Special Forces. Army Special Forces, which is also referred to as Green Berets, are an unconventional special operations force, capable of training and leading unconventional warfare forces or clandestine guerrilla forces in an occupied nation. Many of their operational techniques are classified. Now that we've given you a brief overview on both of them, we're going to go deeper into each of their capabilities, missions, and opportunities. Let's go over the Rangers first. These guys are capable of a lot, so sit tight as we list what they can do. There are three pillars that make up the Ranger mission. Special Operations Raids, Forcible Entry Operations, and Special Reconnaissance. They can conduct airborne and air assault operations, seize key terrain such as airfields, destroy strategic facilities, and can execute missions that involve intelligence and counterintelligence, combat search and rescue, personnel recovery and hostage rescue, and counterterrorism. And this is only scratching the surface. Rangers are capable of conducting missions through regimental size operations and are resourced to maintain exceptional proficiency, experience, and readiness. They deploy often, and their deployments tend to be around three months long. They can be rapidly deployed within 18 hours of notification. Just think about that. No matter where they are, what's going on, or what they're asked to do, they can be on their way to anywhere in the world in less than a day. So you have an idea of what rangers can do, but do you know what schools and training they can receive? And before you think about it, don't fret. We'll get into their initial training pipeline later in the video. Because of their diverse mission set, rangers can be sent to a multitude of schools and receive a lot of training. To name some, they can go to SEER School, Special Operations Combat Medic Course, or SOCOM for short, Sniper School, Air Assault School, the Jungle, Mountain, and Arctic Warfare Schools, Military Freefall, Sapper, Combat Diver Course, JTAC, and much more. Rangers are able to receive a lot of additional training because of how diverse these soldiers are. Unlike the Green Berets, Rangers have several different MOSs that are in regiment. The list of MOSs that a Ranger can be is super long, and we won't bore you by listing them all. Instead, here's a picture of them. Yeah, there's a lot. If you're not one of these MOSs, sorry, you can't be in regiment. Rangers also have the opportunity to serve in the Regimental Reconnaissance Company and Delta Force. Both of these units are Tier 1 Special Missions units within the United States military. Only the best of the best are selected for these units, and each of them has a grueling selection process. We've done videos on both of these elite units, but you'll be better off waiting until you're done watching this video to go give them a look if you haven't seen them already. Alright, now it's time to go over the capabilities, missions, and opportunities for Green Berets. Green Berets possess a wide variety of skills and expertise that make them a vital and lethal asset in the battlefield. Here comes another list for you. Green Berets execute nine doctrinal missions, unconventional warfare, foreign internal defense, direct action, counterinsurgency, special reconnaissance, counterterrorism, information operations, counterproliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and security force assistance. As you noticed, the first on that list was unconventional warfare, which is the cornerstone of what they do. Unconventional warfare consists of activities conducted to enable a resistance movement or insurgency to coerce, disrupt, or overthrow a government or occupying power by operating through or within an underground, auxiliary, 
and Guerrilla Force in a denied area. That's pretty much a fancy way of saying that Green Berets can be in South America training military police to fight drug cartels or assembling guerrilla armies in Vietnam. It's their bread and butter to be working with and training foreign entities. Some of their other duties and responsibilities are combat search and rescue, counter narcotics, hostage rescue, humanitarian assistance, humanitarian demining, peacekeeping, psychological operations, and manhunts. Due to their language training, they can be deployed anywhere in the world where they have received training on the culture and language of the region. Special Forces soldiers deploy under ODAs, which stands for Operational Detachments Alpha. A SF company normally consists of around six ODAs, with each one bringing a specific skill set to the mission at hand. We'll discuss ODAs more in depth during the structure breakdown later in the video. Hey there, we hope that you're enjoying the video so far. General Discharge has a Patreon. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining the team. Links in the description. Now back to the video. On top of their lengthy pipeline, which includes language training, Green Berets are offered a slew of additional training opportunities depending on where they are placed. They can go to Air Assault School, Mountain Warfare, Sapper, Pathfinder, Sniper School, Combat Dive School, Sockham, and even Ranger School. And no, that doesn't make them a Ranger, they just earn the tab. When we go over the initial training pipelines, you'll understand why this makes sense. You probably noticed we said that both Rangers and Green Berets can go to Sockham. The key difference, however, is that Rangers go to the short course, and Green Berets go to the long course. The long course, which is Special Forces Medical Sergeant, or SFMS for short, is an additional four-month course on top of Sockham that is only available to Green Berets and Navy Sarks. Another commonality that Green Berets have with the Rangers is their ability to join Delta Force, but this is not a guarantee, nor are they given favoritism over Rangers. But that's all we'll say about that. To wrap up the capabilities, we will show you all of the MOSs that make up Special Forces. There are less MOSs in SF than there are for the Ranger counterparts. Here's a list of them. Pause the video if you want to take a longer look. Alright, we just went over with you all a very brief breakdown of what Rangers and Green Berets are capable of. For a quick recap, you just learned that the main difference between the two is that Rangers are a fast, hard-hitting, elite light infantry force that does a lot of direct action raids, whereas Green Berets focus more on unconventional warfighting. You'll come to realize that even though they both fall under USASOC, comparing these two is like apples and oranges. So what if you wanted to be a Ranger or a Green Beret? What would your journey look like, and what would it take? Let's go over their training pipelines, and the requirements to get into them. Just keep in mind, the goal of this video is to introduce you to everything. We can't go over every intricate detail, otherwise this video would be over an hour long. If you want to learn more, we encourage you to do your own research. If you set your sights on becoming a Ranger, and you join with an Option 40 contract as a civilian, your pipeline to become a Ranger will look something like this. Basic Training, Slash OSUT, RASP, and then Airborne School. Sounds simple, right? Wrong. It's much more challenging than it seems. After one station unit training, which is a combination of basic training and advanced individual training, you'll go to RASP-1, which stands for Ranger Assessment and Selection Program. RASP-1 is eight weeks long, and trains soldiers in the pay grades E1 through E5 in the basic skills and tactics in order to operate in the 75th Ranger Regiment. Now there's a RASP-2, which is three weeks long, and is for senior non-commissioned officers, warrant officers, and commissioned officers. This course assesses the suitability of mid and senior grade leaders for a assignment to the regiment, and teaches them the operational techniques and standards of the Ranger Regiment. So this means you'll be tested slightly differently if you happen to want to get into the 75th Ranger Regiment later in your Army career. Just to give you an idea of how tough Ranger training is, RASP-1 has a 53% attrition rate, and RASP-2 has a 74% attrition rate. If you make it through RASP, you'll go to the U.S. Army Jump School to receive your jump wings, and then you'll report to your respective Ranger Battalion. You are now a scrolled Ranger. This is the Ranger Scroll. But what does this mean? Well, while you are in Regiment, and you have your Tan Beret, you're not completely done yet. You still need to go to Ranger School, where you will earn your Ranger Tap, which looks like this. Once you are tapped and scrolled, you have now permanently earned your place in the 75th Ranger Regiment. The Ranger Tab is something that anyone who was sent to Ranger School can earn. It's essentially a qualification and small unit leadership. Members from all branches can attend Ranger School and earn the Ranger Tab, such as Navy SEALs, SARCs, 
Air Force personnel, and Marines. But that doesn't make them a bona fide Army Ranger like those who are in regiment. While it may seem confusing at first, it is a pretty simple concept once you're familiar with it. Okay, you know the journey that lies ahead of you if you want to be a Ranger, but what are the requirements to get your foot in the door? Well first off, you need to have a GT score of 105 on your ASVAB. If you don't have that, start studying. In order for a soldier to qualify to attend RASP, they must be able to pass the Ranger screening, which includes a psychological review, background check, and a urinalysis. And then you'll have to pass the RASP Entry Fitness Test, which has a minimum requirement of 53 push-ups, 63 sit-ups, a 2-mile run in 14 minutes and 30 seconds or less, 4 pull-ups, and a 6-mile ruck run with a 35-pound ruck and weapon in less than 90 minutes. We'll leave you with this before we move on to Special Forces. The only way to guarantee a shot at becoming a Ranger is by signing an Option 40 contract. While you may get the opportunity to volunteer for RASP if you join with a different contract, there is no guarantee the Army will afford you the chance. The same goes for officers. There's no guarantee you can become a Ranger if you join the Army as an officer. Alright, now that you just got the basic breakdown of the Ranger's training pipeline, let's imagine you want to be a Green Beret. What would your path look like? If you're joining as a civilian with an 18 X-ray contract, your first step will be Infantry OSUT. After OSUT, you will attend Special Forces Preparation Course, or SFPC, which prepares you for the Rakers Ahead in SFAS, teaching you land navigation along the way. After SFPC, you'll go to SFAS, which is short for Special Forces Assessment and Selection, and if selected, you'll also attend Jump School. While all SF candidates go through SFAS together, their pipeline lengths may differ depending on their specialty that they are given. Their qualification course, often referred to as their Q course, varies. For example, SF-18 Deltas will go through several months of schooling in SOCOM and SFMS before they are finished with their training, whereas an A Team Bravo SF member will go through roughly 10 weeks of training for their specialty. There are multiple phases that an SF candidate goes through before they are finished with their initial training. Here are the phases. Phase 1, SFAS, which is 4 weeks, and Course Orientation and History, which is 7 weeks. SFAS is a 4-week course where soldiers will be put through several physical and mental tests, and if they are selected at the end, they are greenlit to continue training. The Orientation and History part is, and you'll be shocked when you hear this, is where candidates will learn about the history and structure of SF. Phase 2, Language and Culture, 18-25 to 25 weeks. This is where soldiers learn their specific language they are assigned to learn, as well as the culture of the areas they will be operating in. Phase 3, SF Tactical Combat Skills and SEER, 13 weeks. This is where they learn, as it says, small unit tactics and attend the SEER Level C course. Phase 4, MOS Training, Time Varies. This is where the candidates are sent to their designated MOS career paths that we discussed before. Phase 5, Robin Sage, 4 weeks culmination phase for SF candidates. Soldiers must put all the skills they have learned throughout SFQC to the test in an unconventional warfare training exercise located throughout 15 different counties of North Carolina. Phase 6. Graduation. One week. Now officially finished with training, soldiers officially don their Green Berets for the first time and go through a week of outprocessing. As you can see, the Special Forces pipeline is much longer than the Rangers pipeline. This doesn't mean one is better than the other. It simply means that each entity has a different purpose and goal for what they bring to the table in the world of special operations. So what are the requirements to even get the ball rolling? As a civilian, you will have to meet these basic requirements to obtain an 18 X-ray contract. Be a US citizen, be at least 20 years old by your ship date to Infantry OSA, and not have reached your 32nd birthday prior to the same ship date. Qualify for airborne training, meet the PFA minimum standard of 49 push-ups, 59 sit-ups, 15 minutes and 12 seconds 2 mile run, and 6 pull-ups. Eligible for a secret security clearance. For active duty soldiers, both enlisted and officers, there are several other requirements that must be met, but it would take a long time to go over these details. For the sake of time, we will leave a link in the description to the official US Army's website that goes over in detail what is required. Lastly, for the requirements, another step in your process to get into the Special Forces Pipeline is by taking the DLAP which stands for Defense Language Aptitude Battery, which is a test where you can learn a made-up language to see how you will perform when you start learning an actual language. The language you learn will affect where you will be placed once you finish your training. Some of these languages may be Farsi, Spanish, French, Russian, Mandarin, Indonesian, Tagalog, and Arabic. Also, 
If you already know one of the languages we have mentioned, they will most likely train you in another one so they can double dip and have someone who knows several languages instead of just one extra. Alright, let's pretend you made it through one of these pipelines, and now you're getting put to work. Where do you go? How is everything structured? Let's get into it. As an army ranger in the 75th Ranger Regiment, you can be stationed in three different locations at five different battalions. Here are the locations. First Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment, is at Hunter Army Airfield, Georgia. Second Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment, is at Fort Lewis, Washington. Third Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment, is at Fort Benning, Georgia. Regimental Special Troops Battalion is at Fort Benning, Georgia. And finally, the Regimental Military Intelligence Battalion which is at Fort Benning, Georgia. Now let's go over the structure of the 75th Ranger Regiment. We've covered the structure of them before, but we're going to go over it again for the sake of comparison. For a quick broad strokes breakdown of the 75th Ranger Regiment, each battalion has an HHC company, and Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Echo companies, respectively. The Regimental Special Troops Battalion has a Reconnaissance, Communications, Military Intelligence, and Selection and Training Company. There's way more to it, but you won't need to know the specifics until you're actually in regiment. Now let's move on to the Green Berets. There are seven groups that make up 1st Special Forces Command, which is the overarching makeup of the Green Berets. Each group gets deployed to different locations and has different tasks at hand. As a Green Beret, you can be stationed at 1st SF Group, which is based out of Joint Base lewis McCord, Washington and Okinawa, Japan. 3rd SF Group at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. 5th SF Group at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, 7th SF Group at Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, 10th SF Group at Fort Carson, Colorado, and Stuttgart, Germany, 19th SF Group, a National Guard component, at Draper, Utah, 20th SF Group, also a National Guard component, at Birmingham, Alabama. That's a lot of places. Now let's get into the basic breakdown of the SF Groups. We're going to keep this as simple as possible, and you'll learn more about this if you actually make it through training. There are C-teams, B-teams, and A-teams. C-teams are the headquarters element of an SF battalion, with command and control capabilities and logistical support responsibilities. The battalions usually consist of four companies. In these companies, the headquarters element is the B-teams, composed of 11 to 13 soldiers. The purpose of the B-team is to support the company's A-teams, both in garrison and in the field. Now we're on to the A-teams, which are referred to as the ODAs like we previously mentioned in this video. They are the operational elements of an SF unit. An SF company typically consists of six ODAs, each of them specializing in an infiltration skill or particular mission set. Examples of these are military freefall teams, combat diver teams, mountain teams, mobility teams, and others. An ODA consists of 12 soldiers, each of whom has a specific function on the team. However, all members of an ODA conduct cross-training. And that pretty much covers it for the structure of SF units. We'll leave a picture on screen for you to look at if you want a better idea of the breakdown of it. Pause the video if you want to take a longer look. Well, that is the down and dirty of the US Army Rangers and Special Forces. Whew, we covered a lot in this video. If you're still with us, you're awesome. You probably learned a lot about Rangers and Green Berets. We're sure you'll come to realize that both of these entities are a force to be reckoned with and have made an everlasting impact in the world of special operations. We'll leave you with some videos we think you should check out. We did videos individually on both the Rangers and the Green Berets, as well as a video on Delta Force and the Regimental Reconnaissance Company. If you want a better understanding of everything, we highly recommend you go give them a look. The links are all in the description. If you learned something from this video, make sure to give us a like and subscribe to our channel. As always, thank you for watching. Do you even want to be here? A big shout out to all of our patrons over at our Patreon. Thank you all so much for taking the extra step in supporting our channel. It is much appreciated. If you'd like to be featured on a general discharge video, go give our Patreon a look and join the team. Here's Nick Nausea. All your friends are subscribing to General Discharge and you don't even want to be here.